Welcome to Parallax Views, a series of conversations about cultural politics uh, hosted by the Institute of Economic Affairs. My name is Mark Glendenning, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Ruth Smeeth, um, who is a veritable grand legume <laughs> in the area of politics concerned with freedom of speech. Um, Ruth is the uh, executive director of Index on Censorship, uh, an organization we're going to hear more about its work, uh, but which is probably the most prominent pro-free speech organization in this country. Ruth has a long track record of political communication. Um, in that uh, she has worked for major companies, trade unions, the British Israel Communications and Research Centre, among other organisations. And in 2015, Ruth was elected as the Labour Member of Parliament for Stoke-on-Trent North, though I think it's fair to say you had a few areas of difference with your then <laughs> party leader, Mr Corbyn, and some of his supporters, which we may come on to uh, later. Um, I'd like to, to start by asking you how you first got interested in this area of politics. Uh, and does it, your commitment to free speech, is that in some way connected to your left of centre politics, would you say? I have held many privileged positions, not least the fact that uh, as a member of parliament and having completely protected speech in the House, but I'm also aware of how privileged I am. I am a, uh, a third generation immigrant. I'm a woman and just over slightly over 100 years ago, I wouldn't have been allowed to have voted, never mind hold the job that I held. Every change, every social change that has been delivered in this country, and obviously I would say from the labor movement, but every social change that's been delivered has been because people use their rights to free expression and free speech. Every social justice campaign, every equality campaign, every, I believe we're meant to call them now, liberation campaign, they all came because of our rights to, um, to freedom of association and freedom of expression. And I think it's one of the things I found most disconcerting in recent years about the conversation around free expression is that the left have forgotten how important it was for every win that we've ever had, whether it was, um, whether it was those as simple as the right to vote, whether it was the creation of trade, of trade unions, whether it is, um, uh, whether it's been the civil rights movement, whether it's been equal marriage, they've all come about, as you know, the anniversary of Pride is this year. They've all come about because of our right to free expression. And it, if you want social change, if you want to deliver change in the country, you've got to take people on a journey with you. You can only do that if you're telling stories. And it's an incredibly important part of the labour tradition, the labour movement tradition, of telling stories and taking people with you. It's an incredibly important right that we need to protect. It's very strange for me as somebody coming from a, I would say liberal, but centre-right uh, background, to see the transition on the, on the left on this issue. Because when I was growing up, the people who were most stridently wanting censorship tended to be Christian conservatives mm -hmm. like Mary Whitehouse and those kind of people. Uh, and it was typically the left, maybe not the Marxist left, left obviously, but certainly the mainstream centre left, who were the people who were standing up yep. for freedom of speech. And so you've now got, uh, it's, it's so extraordinary to see this transition and disturbing because unless freedom of speech and the sort of other political uh, liberties, civil liberties you, you've mentioned are respected, then it's, it's difficult to see how liberal democracy and a pluralist democracy can survive if a very significant proportion of the political community and the population don't really believe in it. I think that's incredibly fair. I think that one bit that's missing is an understanding of our history. And one of the wonderful things about our society is we're always moving on to the next discussion and the next issue. But we have failed to remember where we've come from and the battles that we have and uh, have had and won or lost. And I think unless you have an appreciation of who we are and why we are, 
then it's easy to forego some core rights because you don't understand their value because you take them for granted. And so there is a huge responsibility on those people that have fought those battles to explain why um, these, are, these values are so incredibly important. I think as horrendous, as heartbreaking and devastating as the events are in Ukraine, we have seen clear attacks on media freedom. We have seen journalists kidnapped. We have seen people's voices silenced. If we do not explain to people how important, in a, in a domestic context, how lucky we are to have the BBC, whether you love or loathe, to have a free media, then we have missed the opportunity to explain our own history and to explain and protect those rights that we collectively share and agree on. I think the, the point you've made is, 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 is fascinating uh, and, and very important uh, in terms of the historical dimension, because freedom of speech was seen uh, once Britain started to become established as a liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. It was seen as one of the sort of core principles of our society. So Karl Marx could come over here and, you know, at the every British taxpayers. Every project, well, they're, yeah. they're, you didn't get any money then. So like, yeah. every, but the intelligentsia always arrived here. We, we had thriving, yeah. there is a reason why we've always had thriving um, diaspora communities based yeah. in the UK, why Pushkin House exists, why there are so many different forms of um, diaspora communities that, are, that challenge and their contribution to British society has been huge and we should celebrate that. Yeah, and that, that, so that was an, an incredibly exciting thing that was developing in the late 19th and early 20th century, um, even though the franchise obviously hadn't been extended to, to women. But broadly speaking, we were moving in a, there was a sort of liberal, yep. small L liberal trajectory on political, if not economic um, questions. And I think one of the problems now, going back to your point about history, is that if British history is perceived as it is by elements of what might be described as the new left, as appalling, as fundamentally unjust, that this sense of pride, at least in our political history and the development of parliamentary institutions and, and free trade unions and, and the rest, if that isn't appreciated and we're portrayed as having always been a fundamentally oppressive society, then people aren't really going to value those traditions because they're going to be seen themselves as part of yep. the machinery of oppression. But we've got to, so there is a, there's an onus on us, as I said, that we've got to educate. It is, I mean, and I would question the new left, I think you mean the new far left, because that's um, uh, not centre left. But, you know, so one of the things that I loved doing uh, in the middle of the horror show that occurred during Jeremy Corbyn's ten, tenure as leader was asking people who were shouting at me about, you know, I obviously wasn't real Labour. Why have we got a red rose as our logo? Explain to me, do you know? And none of them would know, because they don't know the history of the Labour Party. They had no idea that it was based on, a, um, on an industrial dispute in New York that was led by a Jewish woman. They had no idea about Bread and Roses as a poem. They had no idea of our history. I don't need to be lectured at by people who don't know where we come from. But there was an onus on me as on them to educate them, to talk to them about what battles we'd won and why, how we got where we've got to, and how you only understand the net. I mean, there is a big thing on the left. You have to keep fighting for the next thing, because if you're not fighting for the next thing, you're protecting and trying to conserve what you've already got, and we never win those battles. <laughs> you always win those battles, we never win those battles. So fighting for the next thing is really important for us. Um, but you can't forget the successes and the fights and how difficult and painful some of them have been for different people. Otherwise, you forget everything about us. And uh, it's the institutional memory. And in part, I mean, one of the issues that we have, and it's going to be a genuine challenge, but I would query how many of the young researchers that work for the IEA pick up a book rather than Google? 
And so well, that's a very leading question, I and mean, we might be asking some of them yeah. later that, yes. And that it gives, I mean, so I was having a conversation <laughs> with um, the Foreign Office have scrapped their files. There used to be a librarian on every floor, and that is the wonderful thing of, uh, of British history, is that our files at the Foreign Office were on each country, which have gone, you know, would have been yeah. reams and reams, but it meant that we had the institutional knowledge. Now someone will just Google it. That Google will give you the generic answer. It won't give you the flavour of what we or had contributed or why we contributed. It's a really short-sighted thing to do. Um, and I think we've got to really review on how we use knowledge, how we use history, um, and how we challenge it. Because people's perceptions of history, and even though, and those on the right that are protecting history, I don't think they know what they're protecting either. Britain, like every other country in the world, has done amazing things. And there's done really bad things, and there is good to be celebrated, and there's bad to understand so that we never repeat it. And I think anything else is both naive and politically, maybe politically conducive now, but very dangerous in the long term. Um, moving on to index on censorship, um, you're known for your work in championing the rights of journalists mm -hmm. and writers. Um, often operating in very difficult circumstances in other countries. And it might be interesting for you to tell us a bit about you know, what you do in practice and what your particular focus of concern is right now. So Index is history, if you just indulge me for a moment. It is no, we, we, we want to. Um, so it was our 50th birthday um, in March. And we were set up in response to some of the demonstrations in 1968. We are very much a creation of the Cold War. And we were set up by the Liberal Intelligentsia in the UK to provide a platform for the Liberal Intelligentsia behind the Iron Curtain, to provide a platform for them to publish their work, for dissidents to publish their work, and for them to tell their stories. And there is a romance to it. It's very much a John le Carre novel. In fact, his son has written for our anniversary edition as a oh, wow. spy that's, story. That's fantastic. Version of our, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, it truly was like that. So Has we, this been published? It I'm has been published. I'm a big le Carre fan. So. Oh, I will, um, I'll send you, I will send yeah. you a copy of the magazine. It, um, it has been published, and it's lovely. So it's... Um, we were, and in fact, the original editor of the magazine is still alive, so he's written for us about the foundation of Index. Um, we would sneak work out of Behind the Iron Curtain, we would bring it to London, it would be edited, and then we would sneak it back in. And it would be passed from house to house. So that it was the ultimate form of solidarity. They knew that their words, that their stories were being written. And then um, some of the best and the brightest in the UK and um, in Europe and America would also write for us. So there was one point where Chaval, when he was in, uh, Vaclav Chaval, when he was still in prison, was doing um, uh, was doing sparring playlets with Beckett that wow. were published on the pages of our magazine, and people like Philip Roth snuck them back in. So it was the people who could go to the um, uh, could go to Eastern Europe and Central Europe without too much pressure. They would sneak our magazines back in. So it's an incredibly romantic form of... Have you read these, what did you call them, sparring playlets? playlets? Yeah, so... <laughs> I mean, um, that sounds fast. Yeah. Um, by Beckett was one of them. Right. Um, so, uh, yeah, they're extraordinary. And they're, um, the great and the good of the time wrote for us. But we didn't know they were going to be the great and the good. They were the people who ultimately came and held democratic positions, but we published dissidents. Um, and, and, and further afield, because we published the work of those who we believe to be persecuted in uh, repressive regimes, which is what we do. Um, and we continued to pub and we published, um, after the fall of the Cold War, we published Salman Rushdie when no one else would publish him. Um, we snuck out, um, we published poetry that was snuck out of Iran from Naz uh, Nazanin Zaghari Radcliffe. We continue to provide a platform for those people who can't be published elsewhere, or so that their stories are told on there. And it's both, both journalists, but also um, writers, scholars, and artists, so provide a platform for them. The front page of our magazine is um, always is, is painted now or drawn by a censored artist from somewhere in the world, because I think it's incredibly important for us to cherish that culture and provide a platform. Our focus now, for the last 18 months, we've been publishing the um, letters from Lukashenko's prisoners 
So um, once a fortnight we publish a letter from, from one of the political prisoners that's been in prison since the coup, including one of my former staff, who is served over 400 days now in prison. Mm -hmm. um, he was arrested not for being on the protest, but for paying the fines of people who'd been wow. on the protest. Yeah. And he's now been charged, charged with treason, undoubtedly because of his connection working for an organisation based in the UK. And I can do nothing to help him. I can't tell you how difficult that is. We put, uh, we've worked for a long time in, uh, in Hong Kong and in China. Um, we've got a work stream called Banned by Beijing. So we do stuff that's... We support those people that are still trying to be journalists and artists and reside and remain in Hong Kong. But we also support the diaspora community too. Um, but we're actually also exploring how the CCP are trying to use their soft or sharp power outside their own borders. Um, to control the narrative around them and to censor outside their own borders. Um, and we've done a lot of work, unsurprisingly, in Afghanistan. But as we speak, Russia and Ukraine are our focus, like everybody else's. And it, bring, it felt very deja vu, takes us straight back to why we were founded, um, to provide a platform for those people behind, especially as we head into what will probably be a new Cold War. So that's incredibly important work and obviously geared to countries which are overtly authoritarian. But do you involve yourselves also uh, with regard to free speech issues within this country? I mean, for example, uh, a lot of us at the IEA, um, Victoria Houston in particular, who you know, are very concerned about the current government's um, online safety bill. Yep. Are you we do. doing stuff on that? So when we were launched in 72, um, Stephen Spender, who was the famous poet of the day, he was our founder and he wrote, uh, we were launched on the page of the Times and he wrote an op-ed and his argument, which I take as our founding treaty really, his argument was you needed to cherish the values of free expression at home in order to articulate and fight for those abroad. Um, and he, even in 1972, he discussed the impact of technology and how it could be used to curtail our voices. Um, and so it is incredibly important um, that organisations like Index on Censorship, in my opinion, fight very strongly for uh, the rights to free expression in the UK and in Europe in order to... Um, <laughs> to be able to speak with moral authority when we're campaigning internationally. Um, the online safety bill is very much a case in point. I, I um, enjoyed very much doing work with Victoria but, um, and other organisations. And it's a broad coalition, politically and, um, and further afield, because it's ideologically incoherent, the government's approach to free expression at the moment. And this is a very dangerous piece of legislation which may not feel dangerous in a UK context, because obviously we would trust our liberal government. Well, speak for yourself. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that was me trying to be generous well, to you. Yes, I know. <laughs> um, Far too generous, in uh -huh. my opinion. But anyway. Uh. <laughs> but, but how... Um, we've already seen some not quite as progressive le um, uh, regimes look and reference the, on, the online safety bill for quite how it could be applied to them and how could we possibly complain? Yeah, you know, that's one incredible. Of, yeah. Yeah, one of the provisions in this legislation is that the Secretary of State will get to tell providers for 28 days without any scrutiny or oversight what should be removed. Okay, And it doesn't even have to be illegal stuff that's no, it's legal. potentially illegal. No, legal but harmful yeah. content. Which um, means what? Well, <laughs> well, if they could tell us that would be a good starting point. Yeah. And for, for other regimes... That would be a gift, surely, because, well, the UK do it, so what's yes. the problem with us doing it? Yeah. You can't possibly criticise. Uh -huh. This is a very, very bad place we go. So, yes, we do touch on issues of academic freedom, media freedom and digital rights as well, because it's incredibly important for us to be able to... So it can't, so it can't be pushed back. You, you're fighting for something that you don't even have at home. Mm. I mean, one of the most extraordinary aspects of the legislation um, is that there will now be a provision to criminally prosecute people, so people potentially could go to jail for causing serious psychological harm 
as determined by the police and the CPS. Now, this I <coughs> find quite bizarre. I don't know what your view about it is, but I, I think this is very, very alarming. I think it is so incredibly subjective. And as yeah. I, uh, my argument would be, I have been in the middle of so many, unfortunately, social media storms and threatening uh, and have received death threats and abuse online. My level of psychological harm, you've got to, you've got to threaten to hurt me for it to really affect mm. me. Um, as horrible a thing that is not an invitation for people to do that, by the way. But that is, um, but my level of psychology, my threshold for psychological harm would be somewhat higher than someone who is experiencing bullying online for the first time. And it's how you're going to define that if that is the threshold. And it's also it is it is such a blunt instrument this legislation. So it talks about legal but harmful as a new category of speech that can be removed or has to be managed online. And whether that is bullying behaviour, whether that is racist but not hate speech, there are so many different parts of it. But there's also, so there was, there's one politician who suggested that the word rape should be removed from all comments online as an automatic thing. Now, I, I am very, um, I have not had that experience, thank God. But it's my understanding that the majority of people who talk about rape tend to be the survivors of rape rather than the perpetrators. So this legislation, and that's just one example, could take away the people of the rights of people to talk about their own lived experiences about things that are incredibly unpleasant. But it takes away the support spa the spaces online that would provide support for them. You know, one of the organisations that will be affected by this is Mumsnet. They want to remove pathways for um, one of the goals of the government is to remove pathways for um, encouragement of suicide, which is a very laudable aspiration. But if you've got postnatal depression and you're having a conversation on a chat about how you feel and what you'd like to do to yourself and your lowest of low, that could be seen as inciting people to suicide that would be automatically deleted. Can you imagine? You're already at your lowest of low. You're talking about your lived experience. You're asking for support, and the platform will delete it. I don't think that this is... I think the unintended consequences of this legislation are vast. It will create speech codes online, and as we all know, speech codes will lead to dog whistle and alternative language, because language evolves so quickly, government won't be able to keep up with it, and Ofcom won't. And it will become incredibly difficult for people to articulate what's happening to them online. Where, but if they went to the pub or they wrote into the letters page of their local newspaper, completely fine. Hmm. I mean, and also one of the dangers, surely, is that if um, you get people uh, writing in code um, who hold, say, you know, seriously extreme political beliefs, that there's then no longer the opportunity for people who disagree with them to confront those ideas okay. publicly and expose them and have a proper public debate about those ideas. I, I mean, I believe that people should be free to articulate whatever beliefs uh, they so happen to have, no matter how crazy or offensive they may be. So they have, for me, a fundamental right to articulate that. I don't have the right to tell another human being what they can think and, and say or um, expose themselves to on the internet or anywhere else. But another downside for me of this whole thing is that we're, not going, we're going to lose the opportunity to challenge some seriously unpleasant beliefs, and then you'll get more extremist echo chambers because those people will just simply be communicating amongst themselves yep. and those who hold different views won't have the opportunity to challenge them. I mean, we all remember what happened to Nick Griffin when, you know, he went on um, Question Time. And that was a brilliant thing, not just because he, somebody, you know, was being invited who had his views. I think those views sh should find um, expression, so it proved we were a pluralistic democracy, but that he was roundly, intellectually, and morally challenged and seen to lose. 
I think there's, it's, that's an incredibly important part. And as we've seen during some of the discussions during COVID, um, both have being allowed, especially I think for mums talking about and pregnant women talking about, for example, whether they should have the vaccine or not, being able to have a conversation about whether it's right or not for your health and other pregnant women being able to say, I've had it and it's fine. I think that, you know, to take away, that is not an anti-vax conversation. That is a grown-up conversation, but that would have been right on the edge of what is acceptable or not acceptable. Um, I have a bigger fear about this legislation, though, that is both in terms of um, these content, uh, this content will be permanently deleted, probably, because the, the legislation will um, encourage fining or pr prosecution. So the platforms will veer will be conservative in their approach or, um, to removal of content, so it, they will be censored. And there are consequences to that, the most important of which is we won't be able to see how language is evolving. If you care about the pathway to extremism, you won't be able to see people on that pathway. Mm. I know when I am most vulnerable from a security perspective, when not even necessarily the threats online, but a peak of comments online, that suddenly I am vulnerable again. Those would be deleted. Systematic um, comments about me from one person, online stalking, stalking, for example, I won't know I'm vulnerable because you, I won't know that there's been a pattern of behaviour. And worse, if because it's an algorithm, because the sheer volume or uh, it's AI that is deleting some of this content, if my death threat includes... Um, uh, a pejorative comment that would be picked up to be removed anyway about my ethnicity or my gender, how will the police prosecute? Because it's been permanently deleted. I am less safe because of this legislation than I currently am now. I won't know when I'm at my most vulnerable. I won't know that someone's threatening to hurt me. I find this approach extraordinary and I have raised it so many times with different members of the government about even if they are insistent on progressing in the way that they are, why can't we have a digital evidence locker that civil society can see, that the police can see, that journalists can see, all of whom would be vetted, but so that we can see how things are evolving and that the police can see when I'm vulnerable. I like, I think this is from, even from a purely selfish perspective, <laughs> I'd like to know if someone's threatening to hurt me. I don't need to see it, but I need someone else to have seen it. Mm. And that, there's no provision for that at all in this legislation. So even on a practical, trying to keep them, you know, this legislation is not about trying to keep people safer anymore. This legislation is about trying to make the internet nicer. If that is your goal, A, you're going to fail horribly, but B, it's, you're, only, <coughs> you're, you're setting everyone up to fail. Um, returning uh, for a moment to the conversation we sort of started off with about uh, the contemporary left's attitude to free speech. I mean, as a woman of the centre left, yep. I hope you don't mind me calling you. A woman. I am definitely a woman. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, didn't want to make you know. Um, uh, and a high-ranking Labour Party member, why do you think? F what is the reason, sort of philosophically, that fewer people on the left now are strident advocates like yourself for freedom of speech. Why are they so suspicious of speech? Why is it seen as a potentially coercive um, force rather than simply a peaceful, predominantly peaceful um, opportunity to exercise and express belief? I think that members of the alternative right, far right, have done a really good job of trying to hijack it and they've belittled the definition of it. I think that we have failed to articulate the difference between free speech and free expression, which is you know, nuanced but different. Nuance is important. What, what is the, the difference for you? So I think free expression is in its broadest possible definition and I think the left would probably be more comfortable with free expression, whether that is their right to go to pride or their rights to protest or their rights to go and hear um, offensive people speak. I think you know the, the full gamut of um, whereas free speech has become, has become almost belittles 
by the people that have hijacked it. I think conversations around Nazi dogs, which is like some of the most ludicrous conversations we've ended up having, that's been allowed to feed into a narrative that free speech isn't important because it's become, you know, it's become dismissed as something that the right are, have, the, and I, on this, I think the far right have hijacked. Um, and there's been no pushback on it. And I think that we've got to look at, um, and it come, I come back to my original point, you've got to understand the role of free expression in everything else that you believe. I think it is absurd, you know, it comes back to the online safety bill, that we're talking about protecting journalists' rights to free speech and protecting politicians' rights to free speech and nobody else's. I mean, that is utterly absurd, inconsistent, uh, and sort of insulting. Incredibly insulting. <laughs> okay. I couldn't believe it when I said, yeah, will there be an exemption for this category of people, however you define a journalist nowadays, which of course is a, in itself do. is an interesting yeah, uh, uh, conceptual argument. But the notion that you and I um, should have less rights than a, you know, a Telegraph or Guardian journalist I find it bizarre. This is establishing a different category of, of citizenship. It completely is, and no one's noticed. I think that's and obviously, and I say this with complete respect, most journalists aren't going to cover the fact that, they, that their speech is going to be more protected than anyone else's is. But it doesn't make sense, and I think we've got to we've got to cherish the value. Um, and I think that one of the challenges I have for the left, which is why this role is so incredibly important, they are more than happy to pick a cause internationally and to want to platform that cause and fight for them to have their human rights and forget that, that they're under threat at home and the, um, to dismiss or give away some of those rights at home because they're not as valuable. Whereas you know, if you are a trans artist in the Middle East, can you imagine what happens to you? Can you imagine how you are silenced? And we would, and, you know, those people, you know, the left would want, I would want those people to have a voice to be protected and not to be put in prison because of either their sexuality or their, um, or their art. So would most of the left. They've just forgotten why this value is so incredibly important in the British context too. And, yeah. and they've forgotten how to argue, which hmm. is the other part. They want to, you know, which is a fundamental element of this too. I mean, do you think that identity politics in a way... Uh, has a relevance here in explaining, uh, as you say, people being very concerned about, rightly, about the rights of people in other countries, but often actually demanding that, you know, J.K. Rowling or whoever it is be silenced. Do you think identity politics is behind this? Because if you start to see your own society as a series of oppressor or oppressed groups engaged in a kind of Nietzscheian will to power contest with mutually exclusive interests, then you can't really see your political opponents or those you define as having privilege as being the oppressors. You don't really see them as people who should have the same rights that you do or the groups you happen to favour, and that's why I think identity politics, from my perspective, I mean, you may have a different view on this, I don't know, um, is partly to, partly explains this drift to what I would consider to be highly illiberal authoritarian politics within, oh, the, within the left, or an element of the left. Of oh, Britain. I think they're lazy. No, I think it's uh, lazy, I think it's genuinely lazy and not wanting to actually challenge or engage or debate. I think it's the, I think, because yeah, identity politics is so big and such a big issue, but let's be really clear, I am a, yeah, I was a Labour politician who happens to be Jewish, I'm a woman, I am uh, the daughter of a single parent who I adore my mother, but you know, I am, my identity, I am British, but I was born in Scotland, I would also consider myself European, you know, my identity has so many different facets that identity politics is whatever I want it to be at any given moment, as it is for nearly every person, because even you know, people consider themselves London Irish. Like, what is that really? Like, you know, mm. There is so many different parts of our identity that saying this is identity politics is too simplistic and it gives people an out, in my opinion. Actually, 
it's because I don't want to debate. I think you've got to be not very confident in your own views if your ultimate response is to try and silence someone else from having theirs. And for some of these debates, what we actually see is people screaming at women, and it is typically women trying to be silenced on any, on any issue, but in my experience, it's usually women that are trying to be silenced, but screaming at people rather than talking to people. And we've got to figure out, and I, I mean, we've got to explore. Twitter is a brilliant thing for the news. Twitter is a brilliant thing for immediate comment, which is not is an appalling platform for um, debate. It was never meant to be a platform for debate. And we've got into um, a lazy uh, approach of saying that we can have arguments in 20, 240 characters. I mean, that is not sophisticated. It isn't, uh, it's not conducive to a positive society and it isn't going to change the world in the way that anyone wants to change it. All you do is turn everybody that isn't on the fringe of an argument off because they don't want to get involved in it. And there's no room for compromise, there's no room for nuance, there's no room for context. And the problem is if people issue a thousand word statement, which most issues that are this complicated that you've touched on, it requires, it requires more words, not less words. No one reads beyond the first three paragraphs. Like, it's lazy. <laughs> so I think we've got to find space for actual conversation, for actual debate. And to start listening to each other, and it's really, I mean, I, you know, I criticise the government for wanting to make the world nicer. What you've just heard from me is me wanting to make debate nicer, right? But I think we've got to find space for intellectual discussion, and we should be proud of saying that. Because if we can't have debate, we are going to go nowhere. Nothing is going to change. It will be the status quo forever, just with increasingly angry people. And that helps no one. Yeah, and I, mean, I think when people can't or won't debate with words, then, of course, the next step in politics is they seek to use physical power yeah. of one type or another, whether the law or through actual direct intimidation and violence to silence their opponents. And yeah. that's, you know, that's, that is the road to hell. It is. Yeah. Um, last question I want to ask you is, do you see any possibility for a fundamental political realignment on this issue so that people who have very different, who come from very different political traditions, have very different views, say, about economic policy or Brexit or, you know, whatever it happens to be, the future of the NHS, um, might start to come together and coalesce around these kind of cultural issues. Do you, do you see new political sort of fissures developing as we get further into the century, or do you think the fundamental differences between the centre-left and the centre-right will always uh, be the, the key defining factor? Politics will always have to evolve. It has to, life evolves, therefore politics has to evolve. We will always have a centre-left and a centre-right, but it's what those parties or organisations, what they end up, what issues they end up viewing as centre-left or centre-right. And one of the things, and you will rarely hear me say this, one of the things I think we need to be grateful to this government for on the issue of free expression is how ideologically incoherent and aggressive they've been. So there are currently five different pieces of legislation or, or, or consultations on legislation that specifically reference free speech. And each one's got a different definition of what free expression and free speech are, and they're completely inco you know, incompatible. So from the Academic Freedom Bill, where people will have the right to academic freedom and the right to protest, because how can you not have the right to protest mm. on campus, to then the Police Crime and Sentences Act, where you won't have the right to protest, right. to the um, Official Secrets Act, which currently doesn't have a public um, interest clause in it, so you'll never be able to, the government would always be able to say that they're right and you can't tell anybody. Um, the Online Safety Bill, which we've already discussed in significant detail, and the Review of the Human Rights Act, which, um, with the new Bill of Rights, which uh, the Justice Secretary says is the mo um, free expression will be the most important of all human rights. It's completely intellectually bizarre, and I would hope 
that one of the things that comes from this is a conversation across party, across society, about, well, there are these now five, six different definitions. What do we actually want? Why is this value important to us? And what does it actually mean? And it is not the culture wars, and it is not about whatever woke is or is not. It's about our fundamental right to be able to talk to each other and how we talk to each other. So that has to be, you know, if, the, if I see any positive from this government's approach to free expression, it's the fact that they're building it up so badly, we might actually lead to, some, to a national conversation about what it needs to be. Hmm. And I think also there needs to be um, a more sort of fundamental philosophical uh, level of discussion as to what regarding what the nature of humanity is and what is it that makes human beings fundamentally different from other uh, types of animal. And it seems to me our capacity to speak, to communicate our beliefs and our desires is a very fundamental part of what it is to be a human being. Mm -hmm. um, and once you start tampering with that very sort of primal um, instinct and capacity, then you're removing part of what it is to be human. Uh, and if you get groups of people or the state telling you what you can say and can't say, then that to me is diminishing our capacity to be human beings and maybe leading us towards a more sort of primal, animalistic form of politics. But perhaps I'm, <laughs> I'm getting carried away. I hope that's not where we end up. Yeah. But unsurprisingly, as someone who used to hold elected office, I think words are incredibly important. Obviously, you know, you can't stop politicians talking for toffee, right? So, you know, I think the more words we have, the better. We are living in a world that is currently incredibly unstable. Diplomacy needs lots of words, not fewer words. If we are not aware of how important this is to us, then I agree we're in a very, very dangerous place. Ruth, thank you so much for taking the time to come and Pleasure. talk to us. Uh, it's been utterly fascinating. And um, we can only wish you well with the f extraordinarily important work you're doing at Index on Censorship. Thank you very much. On behalf of the IAA, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.